And thanks to our first session sponsor, uh, Build Equinox with the CERV. Uh, the CERV smart ventilation system is where ventilation is headed in the future. You've got balanced ventilation that runs really low uh, and then detects pollutants in, the in your client's home and then ramps up to exhaust those pollutants uh, when they come in. On top of that, it can be integrated with a, uh, it's, or it is integrated with a heat pump system. And so you've got, you know, uh, comfort coming in into the house immediately. And even in tighter, potentially multifamily units, this may be the sole heating, cooling, venting, and uh, dehumidification unit all packaged in one. Uh, so very exciting. Check that out at buildequinox.com. And that can actually sync up with our main sponsors uh, today, uh, Mitsubishi. Uh, all electric systems. Um, thanks to our sponsor, uh, Mitsubishi. Today's low load homes require right sized equipment, and most systems, especially gas fire, just can no longer meet that. Mitsubishi has low load, high efficient heat pumps that dehumidify, cool in the summer, and work in reverse in the wintertime. Going ductless reduces costs, makes it easier to meet Energy Star version 3 and Lead for Homes certification. Ductless mini spits can now be hidden in many different ways to meet your client's needs, and ducted systems can now be used as well. Ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to ensure a beautiful space and can be retrofitted right in place of an existing gas furnace and AC uh, in single family or multifamily. We see it happening all the time. Hyperheat ensures an efficient heat delivery down to negative 13 degrees, and backup strip heaters can kick in during the rare but coldest of cold days. Each room of a house can customize comfort while still being all electric and energy efficient for clients with different needs and only heat or cool rooms that actually need it. Uh, in multifamily and commercial, centralized vari uh, uh, variable refrigerant flow or VRS systems work great on large projects looking to serve whole buildings. And one neat thing about these VRS systems is that they can simultaneously heat and cool a building in certain areas that actually need it. Uh, so check out Mitsubishi Comfort today for all your HVAC needs. All right, so I'm excited um, to um, get it uh, for this session. Uh, uh, can we build fast, off-site, right-sized, and foam-free homes that perform better? Uh, this particular course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, GBCI, AIBD, Certified Green Professional, BPI, Non-Whole House as well as AIA health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your local state-based design or contractor license. Um, this session is brought to you by the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute, and I am the executive director. My name is Brett Little, and I will be the uh, session moderator today. And uh, our, our concept, what we're covering today, is within the title of the session, Can We Build Fast Off-Site Right-Sized right Homes, Foam-Free, That Actually Perform and Perform Better? Uh, and so I'm real excited to be introducing um, our speaker here, Bill McDonald, CEO of uh, Phoenix House. His peer passion is to link healthiness and a healthy lifestyle with housing. Uh, distilling this goal down, he's made a large effort in his career that now spans eight years to focus on the affordable housing unit, on low energy use, healthy materials, and now a user experience that is dialed in for the best case for healthy living. And I'm excited because actually Bill um, was one of our first uh, presenters ever when we first started doing our uh, education series. So I'm real excited to um, have him back. I actually also uh, sat on the board um, way back long ago with Bill on uh, the first Passive House um, Committee in Michigan. So it's been, it's been a long time and it's been great to see uh, uh, Bill and his organization progress since back then, and I'm just real excited to be on this session uh, and learn right along with you all. So, Bill, I'm going to hand it off to you, and please uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, Brett, and thanks for the introduction. Um, it's great to be back, and same with with you and your organization. It looks like you have a really nice, beautiful. Uh, following and a great message you're, you're you're putting out there in the world. So, thanks again for the invite. And hello everyone. Um, again, my name's Bill, and um, my company is Phoenix House. And I just thought I would explain a little bit about myself, really rather brief, and then we'll get on to today's learning objectives. Um, just a, a frame of reference for myself and, and Phoenix House is that we're um, working to prefabricate. 
um, low energy use homes. And this is our main daily thread of business. And we're really excited that they're focused on uh, a healthy, healthy materials, you know, healthy focus for the end use. And that we've been building since um, roughly 2014, 2015 and done uh, many projects where um, at our core understanding is our core uh, focus on, on performance is the passive house standard. So I would pose a question to all listening in today to just see, you know, who has some experience with that. I'd imagine that you would, but be thinking about um, passive house behind the scenes. And then we're going to reference it a little bit later today in the discussion. So go on to the next slide. So really we're focused on creating this, this idea uh, or lifetime of, of healthiness, um, meaning that we are able to program um, healthiness through the buildings that we live in. And I think that that's very clear. A um, little bit more about us uh, before I skip forward is that we're based in um, Colorado. It's, the, it's a sunny state. We have something around 300 days of sun per year. Um, and a big local attraction to where we're based is mountain biking. So if you're ever out this way, please message us. We'd love to take you for a loop on the trails. Um, so here we are, the, um, we're looking to talk about today. First, we'll discuss uh, right-sized living spaces. So what does that mean from the design lens? Second, it's how do we position ourselves with an attractive cash flow for ourselves or for our customers? Um, talking about shared spaces or the ability to share a space. And then finally, we'll dive into details that relate to uh, the current method or mode, this popular style of building offsite and how those healthy integrations are programmed. And to start off, I would love to, you know, pose this problem that we're looking to solve as, as an organization. And um, I'm just going to go through a few points here. Is that real big fact that really interested me um, over the last couple of years is understanding that our population is growing significantly and increase uh, you know, by 1.2 billion, roughly, you know, by 2030, give or take. And our main staples for things that we use every day, child care, transportation, basic resources, that those, those demands, those drivers are growing. And I feel as though that um, also is a level of disconnection. Um, we are the most disconnected generation uh, since, um, and when compared to the last generation, um, it what caught me as interesting is that the number of Americans without any close friends has tripled since the 80s. And then people more than ever want to feel a sense of community. These these are huge drivers and interesting facts that we should be considering when we design and plan a building or when we talk about piece of real estate. Um, a few of the points on this is that we're talking about how we've entered in our and living in a shared economy. Um, what's extremely viable and, and easy and within reach are these shared platforms like Airbnbs. Um, uh, Uber is an obvious one. We've got uh, vacation rentals like VRBOs and uh, taking it out of a different industry and, and talking about automotive, for example, because Michigan's really automotive. It's um, you've got autonomous vehicles being planned, and this is a, these these ideas of sharing and investment is um, an interesting, new, and extremely uh, applicable um, uh, driver that will influence our buildings and how we design and live in our buildings. And a, a point that I'd like to have and a takeaway from this problem as we look to solve it. That's how we want to generate options for ourselves. We'll go into that. So um, right sizing. Um, you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised to see that a huge conversation point when we're working with a new homeowner is understanding what's the, what's the best size for myself, my, my current demand, my family, um, what am I thinking about now, and how we compare that to a long-term use. And I think that the question uh, as we're looking to solve these problems and we're talking about these demand drivers, um, a thought is what if you don't have to necessarily know? And um, 
here again is just restating that question on thinking, you know, don't just think about your demand today. So we'll take and break down a small case of where we analyze uh, five to 10 year range, 10 to 20, and then getting into this uh, concept of an empty nester. Uh, empty, nest, empty nester, for those that don't know, is where we've got uh, a family, there's children, those children go off to college or they, they leave the house, and we're left with a scenario where a house that is, was built or occupied is rather uh, vacant. There's areas of the home that are utilized, but there's a lot of excess capacity that is happening in that style home. And I'm talking about houses that were built in the last year, for example, where this is the case that, that will happen if we think long-term, if we think into the future. So we're gonna take an example here, um, which is talking about how a, a house doesn't have to be extremely large, it can be small, to be really smart, intuitive, and flexible. And uh, a target range that we want to talk about and we want to break down is if we look at our demand drivers, and we're talking about programming our, our design, our piece of real estate, it's, um, the, the research has been done. There's been surveys that say that a target range of occupancy would be something around four to 10 uh, full-time occupants in a smaller space is totally reasonable and possible and that there is a range of platforms to support this demand, but we'll take and break down an example to, to describe how that could be. Uh, so here's just a real rough, um, rather dumb footprint that shows us just an example space. We can make and make some comments on a floor plan, but all in all, um, uh, an average, um, let's just call it a three bedroom sized home, 17, 1700 square feet has, a typical rendition of this would have your couple bathrooms, two two bathrooms, and two to three bedrooms. Um, standard footprint. We'll talk about that. Um, it's how we can apply these different concepts to begin to understand how we can make this uh, an adjustable floor plan. So the crazy idea is um, movable walls. So move your walls. And this is the concept that um, really I think works quite well in the sense that um, we've got a bedroom that's connected to a flex space. We want to find ways to seal off that bedroom for privacy. We want to find ways to reduce the sound of the noise, but we're just not sure how to do that, seeing that we want to be able to open that, open that space up. Um, barn doors have been really popular and I've seen this, but this is taking it a step further into something that seals off the space, it's lockable, and there's uh, there's sound deadening qualities to this type of solution. So I won't talk about so much of the, the brand or the, the product quality here. It's more about the fact that we have the ability to program a space to integrate this level of uh, uh, this sort of feature. If we keep on going, we're able to close off um, the kitchen. Think about that you want to be able to prepare a meal, you want to have guests over, you want to cook something, but at that same exact time in that uh, shared space, we're talking about building this um, this type of flexible floor plan, working on these those demand drivers uh, based on occupancy like I've described. There's many times where there's a chance where you want to have a private space and that's just not possible in a typical floor plan or where this has not been thought about. Um, there is other examples and some better pictures of just how this can really lay out and, and play into the home. Uh, landscape. So let's now break down uh, those those details into a um, uh, practical example and see how that makes sense. So uh, typical house design and package is something around this price range of the 260k to 375k mark, where we're working on you know integrating this design, it's got the offsite building package, and it's finished by a GC. Um, and we're working to integrate those movable features. So in this diagram, we can see detailed is that the space that's configurable is that center space with the um, with the uh, the uh, pink uh, marker is representing a flexible space. So that that first floor plan where we were talking about 1,700 square foot, a two maybe three bedroom space, two bathrooms, we can actually convert something like this 
a three bedroom house, let's just call it into up to a six bedroom house. And then if we reconfigure our spaces and we work based on those demand drivers, based on the, the demand of time or a family that, that transitions with time, um, or we're looking for someone, an owner that's looking to have a flexible floor plan from day one, we can take that house that can support two, maybe three full-time occupants all the way up to eight at, uh, at a maximum size. Um, and what's really interesting about that is that if we reconfigure the egress options and the exterior doors, we think about how that gets embedded into a floor plan. We've now just turned uh, a regular house uh, floor plan, a standard plan, into something that's adjustable and can grow or change with you with time and provide you with options based on um, uh, an income or a cash flow option. So taking that even a step further, let's talk about what, what that looks like from, uh, from a cash flow perspective. In standard configurations return zero dollars. If you think about your investment, uh, a house, you know, the old saying goes, is the biggest investment in someone's life. You know, the two to three beds, one not configured or thought about the long term or with flexible options. There's basically a little um, return potential, if you want to call it that, um, from day one. Yes, there's things that you can do to change or to adjust, but at that point in time, we've just built a new house with no embedded options, it's gonna take some time and some effort to rethink a space and program it for these different platforms, uh, taking advantage of the idea of excess capacity and shared capacity. So when we provide these options, we've got these extra uh, bedrooms with flex rooms, we've got uh, uh, additional or uh, revenue sources just from the start, meaning that we have now options. We can choose to open up a space, uh, invite guests over, we can make it uh, a professional rental where you're not there. We can make it where you're living in the space. Um, there's many different configurations that exist just in the one platform. We can really house that four to 10 occupant range um, as far as a target. In this example, I think eight would be a maximum there. But definitely a chance to really, really take advantage of a smaller footprint with many options. So what that looks like is if we're talking about, if you run through your, your scenario, you run through your experience of if we've got some homeowners on, on the webinar today, we have those that are considering uh, being a homeowner, we're coming from an apartment lens, we're pretty much aware of what those costs might be. And in that standard home use, we have zero revenue potential, you've got the ability to source income now with the short-term rental platforms, seasonal rentals, or a long-term formal agreement where we're looking to use this space. And that truly, the, the bulk or the lion's share of the costs um, can be offset and, you know, um, uh, not, not so much accredited, but um, can return to us um, on a monthly or annual basis options for ourselves to not be tied down or you know, really cemented to that investment that really keeps us anchored having a um, uh, high cost of, of, of building and real estate. Um, you know, we're giving ourselves options is the main point there. So um, that was a, basically a broad, uh, big overview of what, what are some options that we're offering um, the, the consumer or the user or the owner and that that truly is something that is we're really dialed into um, and, and uh, making an offering for a floor plan that makes it flexible and attractive. Let's now take a step into um, what our main mainstay, our main day-to-day uh, -day business is, the level of um, offsite building that's taking place, as well as their integrations. And the most important one to start off is what I mentioned as a question early on to start is that at a baseline, we are talking about passive house as the main integration for performance. And really what that means is that um, from a standardized approach, we take a base case of performance over an area of cold climate and assume those details every time, no matter what. So uh, a huge driver that's connected really behind the scenes is this goal to reduce our energy use per square foot and that how we really envision that with our connections as, as our day-to-day -day business is that we, we don't depart from uh, that performance envelope. And that's really the part that we're controlling here is that with an offsite built envelope, 
we have the ability to make these standardized integrations um, and allow them to not depart uh, from a performance standpoint. It's a big important thing to mention. So um, a couple other things that we'll break down as far as offsite integrations and why this is important is that we're working with a dynamic uh, 3D model. And what that means is that from the start, you can see in this image, you have the ability to take um, photos on site with uh, drone technology. And that this drone technology is something that is um, uh, intuitively in imaging a site. And we're able to take that data within no time at all and convert it into uh, a dynamic model of, of the space. The reason why I bring this up is because um, it speaks to this level of technology and this level of uh, investment that's happened behind the scenes to be able to have a very smart model that <clears throat> it becomes information that informs uh, the offsite uh, building process. So from a minimum, uh, we're taking smart data, real-time data that really informs what's the best use and what's the best application to have, uh, just even down to the building site. Um, Here's a few images of the results of this analysis. These are uh, actual images of the photos on site. And then here is the dynamic model that gets exported as a um, one foot contour digital elevation model. And it's, it's a flight plan that takes place and we do more than the target area as far as where development happens. And this then gets embedded into a model. So, Taking it a step further, let's talk about standard integrated um, details. Hey, um, um, there's Rob. Yeah, Bill, I had a I had a question on your drone surveys. Yeah, um, does that um, capture uh, like current solar income potential? The uh, my understanding is that there's really two forms of data that can be collected on site when we're doing a flight plan, and um, neither of those would be from the solar perspective. So we'd still be performing, if you're familiar with like a solar pathfinder tool, um, that analysis on site from the building site, essentially looking up, or um, architectural models have this integration where you can analyze that solar potential, um, you know, through the architectural lens. So from the drone technology, it really does in a sense, look down, and um, from there, I think is all we can say about as far as that. You know, that's pretty much the the one thing that we're taking. Just trying to see if I can look at some more of these questions, but um, yeah, please please interrupt me if there's more that we can be answering. Um, <clears throat> but getting to the standard integrations, I was trying to explain that um, when it comes down to just from a from a fact perspective, we have 28 standardized connections that inform a building envelope. If we break it down uh, into all the different configurations in space, talking about what is actually happening in an envelope where we're talking specifically single family construction, there's there's 28. Um, and as a standard minimum, there's 15. And within those 15, we really start to break down the, that core uh, exterior wall thickness corner detailing, window installation, roof detailing for a typical gable roof style, and that those layers, those assemblies, all have embedded um, the, the level of the past health performance for a cold climate. And that's really interesting because we think about the system and the build is actually a coded language um, where we're actually coding our buildings and we're 3D modeling. Um, and I like to think of it as 3D carpentry where we take uh, and generate a static architectural model or an image that uh, an architect is exporting to us. Then we integrate and make this dynamic live, um, you know, 3D parts model basically that we then print out in our production shop. But the important thing to note here is that here we've got a model in this current one, we op just opened up the corner so you can see inside of the model. Um, we've got the stairway to that wall and the roof is taken off. But uh, what's important to highlight is that there's roughly 4,000 parts in a 3D model and that we have control of every single one of those from a procurement standpoint to a quality perspective to when it turns from a part into a panel until it gets delivered and installed on site. And that 
embedded into all that smart planning and technology is pass files at, at a core. So from an instant perspective, we can have an understanding of what's our percentage of lumber in the wall. Are we ensuring that there's no thermal bridging that's taking place because we do exterior insulation that's continuous? And that is everything dialed into the foundation that sits or gets set up on site before we arrive. So these are really interesting, important things that are integrated when we do uh, when we do prefab. Um, Bill, yeah. um, I'm wondering on that modeling side, um, do you also at that point engage in um, you know estimated utility costs and use that to help drive that conversation as well from the design side? You know, rather than being you know surprised by it during the final inspection or a year later after the bills come out. Yeah, for sure. Um, so from from a performance standpoint, at this stage in design, uh, we have a one-to-one -one dashboard with uh, the the PHPP. Um, otherwise known as the energy model for a passive house. And just in general, a really solid tool to understand performance language. One-to-one -one model, uh, what that is defined as is when we have this smart model, we can export that language. Um, typically it's a SketchUp model, a SketchUp file, that then imports into the energy model software. And one-to-one -one is defined as the placement of the windows, they're revealed, the shading of the roof, its location at the building site, and then its actual specific wall thickness and material buildup um, is all defined at the stage, so you're correct, Brett. And what is a check that um, is up to the owner's decision or deciding is that when presenting those results or when presented those results, it's their decision to know if they want to certify this house or not, but at least they're completely aware of everything before we touch a stick of lumber or something arrives on site. That's a great point that you bring that up. Um, and that's why I bring up the drone imagery and the technology, the same thread of, of analysis and dynamic information, which means it's, it's, a, it's a live working model, is instant, and we know exactly what's happening before we do anything in the physical world. Um, so then the, um, Integrations that we can continue speaking about. A big one is windows and doors. Um, the reason we bring these up is because, um, well, first of all, that it's available, meaning that it's possible now, and it has been for some time, and there's definitely many companies and developments that have had pre-installed windows and doors. What I really like and what we need to bring up and talk about is how these supplies of material, excuse me, um, these manufacturers are now positioning themselves in the United States where 100% of what's being made is sourced in U.S. on domestic soil. And that's really nice to hear that and it's nice to use this approach because it's talking about our total um, investment into a building relating to how we procure the materials and the inputs to create that wall or to create that assembly. We're having or significantly reducing the amount of miles traveled to get a part to our door to then get it to your site. And so there's a lot less um, energy inputs just to source these uh, certified um, triple pane, you know, windows and doors now in this current state. And there's just gonna be more and more as we continue to go on. But it was a staple for us to make sure that we, we made it a point that we were no longer importing a window or door system from a European country or other countries that make windows and doors in the States. At least that was just a focus of ours and something that's specific to us. Um, hey, um, yeah. on, on that note, I'm really glad you brought that up because a lot of people just, when you say passive house, they instantly imagine you must use European windows. So I really appreciate that. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah. The, the second part to that is, you know, we, you know, we all imagine that you must use triple pane windows. Um, however, to my knowledge, there are really good high uh, R value. I like using R value rather than U value personally. For windows right. um right um you know good double pane are high r value windows that you know might be uh, more cost effective what are you seeing um in your work um as far as you're talking about the cost effectiveness with this product um brett if you could just restate that once more i'm sorry yeah. yeah so let me just say you know um you know the idea is to have a really good energy efficient or passive house home you must use triple pane windows which right right you can drive up costs and so 
is it possible now? Are there are there new technologies where double pane windows with just really good you know R values are coming online? Okay, sorry, and, and thanks for repeating the question. Um, no, yes, um, what I see that's really affecting the the cost of the investments, I guess it's twofold. Um, yes, there are some better technologies on on uh, more specifically the frames. I can't say I can speak specifically to any innovations that I'm aware of for gla for glazing units. Um, but I would say that there is, you know, wood is a premium product at the moment. It takes a little bit longer to produce in general, even though it's less than having to import products from Europe. Uh, there are uh, PVC alternates or fiberglass alternates that perform at the stated spec that are about half the cost. And those are being made in the States. Um, so, you know, a triple pane window doesn't have to be extremely expensive to your point anymore. If you're trying to come up with like a, a realistic example, um, of what's affordable, nothing really is coming to mind. Um, I still think that we have some distance between mass market and passive house, you bet. But the, the second point I wanted to make is that you'd be surprised that um, when you can offer an offsite building package that takes those inputs into account, those higher cost inputs, if we take that into account of the speed at which a package can be built and delivered to the site, we can actually reduce the overall total cost to the end user just in the ability to, to produce something off the site. So when the, when the input of a window or door is connected to the whole, the whole being the offsite building package, you can actually find ways to bring those costs down based on volume of the, of the total order. And that's very interesting to me. And I've worked, we've worked a lot on that, is trying to find ways to hit a certain price point. <clears throat> and we're, we're getting there. It's getting less and less with time based on volume. And a, maybe a few cheats, as you can call it, to the to the higher cost of inputs, as you know, specific to us. But um, definitely a topic to follow up on and talk more about into the future. Um, I want to make sure to not skip any questions. So please, Brett, if you can, uh, interrupt me. Um, I can see, I can't see all the questions coming through on my screen, and I don't want to miss anything that you feel is important. So just please interrupt me if there's more. Um, on the pre-installed lens of things, it's worth to note that we're talking about installing something in a controlled environment. So is a, the main uh, value offering of an off-site building model is the fact that we're installing tapes at 65 degrees versus 10 degrees on-site. And this may be a known fact, but um, it's something that's important to bring up is that those tapes, those membranes that can all cure in, in, a, in a conditioned environment and also be uh, adjusted and detailed in one, two. So we're having a chance to pre-install a unit in a, in a window or a door opening. Um, we can do those final adjustments at the shop before they ship to the building site and um, basically ready to rock and roll once these things arrive. I see a question here that I'll answer is that we do a dense pack cellulose in the walls and in the roof panels. Dense pack cellulose is a process where you take cellulose and inject it using a dense pack nozzle under the cavity, you hit a certain density, and that forms an R-value in the wall that's an unsettled um, cavity because of the way that it's been installed. Um, um, when it Bill, comes I, to, yeah. to further yeah. elaborate on that, um, yeah. have you considered um, blown-in fiberglass uh, or mineral wool, or, or is it just, um, you know, use this cellulose as the way to go? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and thanks for asking it. Um, the, the material that can be blown in, uh, we can use a blown product to answer, is, to answer the question. We're netting the cavity and then we're injecting into that opening or into that cavity. Um, so the different material inputs are applicable. Yes, as long as they can be blown, uh, as, as long as they can be blown in. Um, and I'm seeing here a few questions on roofs as well, is that um, when we talk about a roof panel and we do a dense pack cellulose or a dense insulation material in, in the cavity, we always make sure that in the design that that roof panel or that, that house design does have a vented layer on the top so that we are, have a chance to vent this essentially, you know, hot roof scenario. So we want to prevent that. So we do do venting. Um, when it comes to packaging this offering up and delivering to the site, the different modes of delivery are the obvious ones, uh, semi-trucks, flatbeds, everything gets shrink-wrapped and along the way, 
The picture on the left is a shrink wrap that went 3,000 miles. So you can see that, um, I'm sorry, 1,500 miles. You can see that it does stand the test of a weather, you know, wintry road and it does not rip or tear. And that's the important thing is that everything stays dry inside of that wrap. And that we're able to offload these in a very efficient, quick method on site. Um, getting further into the, the value of, of the offsite, um, the reason for these images is that we're talking about how we coordinate and level to a building site. So there's many different types of sites out there. Um, there's many different types of foundations. And the best way to solve any level of disconnect, meaning just the physical disconnect between our product or an offsite product, I should say, and the foundation is the ability to calibrate that foundation. <clears throat> so that's why these leveling plates in the left picture are used. Uh, we're able to sleeve on top of them with our system, and that technique is used throughout the entire project. So walls to walls, roof to walls, you name it. Um, we know exactly when those leveling plates are installed at the building site that within uh, less than an eighth inch uh, tolerance, we're talking about you know accuracy to the 16th, we know that we're going to be able to land perfectly and not have any delays on the install. Um, Day two is the second floor if there if one exists, and then of course the second floor walls. I think those are all pretty straightforward, you know, kind of um, make sense sort of uh, images that you know tell the story. If you look at the image, everything's going in quickly. They go in um, as far as the sequencing, as far as uh, how does the install work. Uh, we typically just go clockwise around the foundation. Sometimes you have to pause and reorganize a bit based on the configuration of the load, depending on the distance of the project. Um, sometimes you, the massive game of Tetris that you're playing on the loading side of things doesn't always shake out um, in the best case scenario for the site, but um, you can always add more trucks to solve that as long as your site is close to the shop. Um, so if we are closer, we can find ways to make it perfectly clockwise and offloaded on site. Uh, to, to save on uh, the, the time on site to install. This is in fact actually day three of a roof install, which means we started with a, that bare foundation with leveling plates on day one, and then we were, were setting roofs and completed with roofs within an actual three day timeline. That's an actual um, fact that a 2,000 square foot house can be installed within that time. Um, and that includes interior structural elements, so that means ridge beams, posts, uh, interior partition walls, and floor systems. So hey, um, what's really nice, yeah, yeah. Um, real quick, uh, and, may, and maybe you maybe you answered this uh, or said it, um, but is this something that takes a specialized uh, crew to come out and do, or is it something um, that anybody who knows what they're doing, get the information and do this if it's delivered or or a third idea uh, is, you know, is this something that local folks can be, you know, trained on in your opinion? Yeah, great question. We get that question a lot. Um, it, the answer to the question is just two answers. Um, we are now able to, or I would imagine that other off-site manufacturers are able to do a full scope of service, which means we have taken the steps necessary to install a package, and we'll get to that. How does that look like here in a minute, where that full that full scope's installed? Um, it's definitely within reason that uh, a local crew can install, and we have done this as a main thread of business to date. Uh, the only thing I'll say as a general statement is that um, there is uh, prerequisites to doing this sort of work. Uh, there's, there's knowledge to be discussed. And um, and there's a way to communicate that effectively uh, using the 3D imagery and using past examples that breaks down uh, the actual parts and pieces around a foundation in a sequence model. Sequence model is defined as which panels go where on which days at which spots around the foundation and up uh, the level of tolerances. So that, that is something that is possible to be communicated uh, as long as that's happening ahead of time before arrival to the site, yes. Uh, last thing I'll say about that is the last thing we want to do is to arrive to the site without having communicated or discussed these items and without a plan for the day. So every time we do an installation, 
there's an exact sequence model and plan for which panels go where and which days they're happening so that we can achieve this level of efficiency at, at the site, which is why we did this whole investment in the first place of, of purchasing or doing an offsite uh, mode of building. Um, um, and then, and here, then yeah. uh, well, it actually looks like you might be answering this next question within this, but yeah. um, but yeah. the specific question is, and if you want to wrap it in here is, you know, how do you air seal those roof panels to the walls? Perfect. Yeah. Um, the answer and it might be a silly one is that we use um, quite a bit of um, tape. We like to use a belt and suspender method. Um, from an interior and exterior perspective to seal up the house to be able to achieve an airtight, uh, airtight detail. Um, but every, every scene that you see, it gets followed up with a piece of tape. And um, specifically, I'll get into a little bit what that tape looks like and why and, and how does that work. But feel as though that that rated bond, that rated seal from uh, a tape manufacturer that, that's focused as a company into airtightness and vapor permeable or vapor permeance, um, the answer to the question is tape, lots of tape. Um, so the, the point I wanted to wrap up here and what we alluded to is that um, what's possible within that first week when the customer elects to have a certain style of foundation and a level of scope, which is a pre-installed window and door system, is that we're able to do a closeout within that week of install. When I say a week, I'm talking about if we're starting on Monday or Tuesday, we're installing for two to three days, and on that Thursday or Friday, and maybe possibly going into the weekend, we're able to perform uh, the taping and, and the necessary requirements to do an airtightness test. And that this is just an example of how we've done one in the past where we're hitting at that pass file level. It's towards that limiting factor of the 0.6 ACH per hour, which is the airtightness requirement for pass files, but um, you know, it's, it's really doable. Um, Let's see here. Um, stepping on to, yeah. You Before you move on, um, you know, I've been told that um, offsite construction, you 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 can't do, uh, or maybe it's full on modular, but either you can't, or it's very difficult to do slab on grade. Um, and obviously, when you're talking right size homes, energy performance, durability issues, um, you know, it seems we're heading in a direction where basements are not really a good idea and slab on grade just makes a lot more sense. So is it possible to, um, you know, utilize this um, for slab on grade? Absolutely. And thanks for bringing that up, Brett, because, um, you know, setting up the foundation is literally a, a big important decision, like you say, um, is that the slab foundation is in fact our standard slab, uh, sorry, our standard foundation protocol, which means that we start every house design with a slab design, and then we can take it from there if someone wants to elect to do a foundation wall, excuse me, a basement or a stem wall or something that is relating to their site or, you know, tipping it into the custom design. But our, our base foundation is in fact a slab, and that slab is uh, frost, um, uh, sorry, thermally broken, floating, um, inflated slab on grade, the floating slab. Um, this is our go-to foundation. So when it comes to um, stepping into this last um, category of healthy housing, um, you can see that healthy housing can be defined as many different things. For right now, we'll talk about material properties because it tends to be an obvious one to discuss. Um, and then from an offsite manufacturer's perspective and lens, Let's talk about some of the decisions that impact our opinion on healthy housing. One being the ability to pre-install siding. And when it comes to siding, there's many options out there. Um, our favorite is one called Shoshugiban. And it's a popular one. Uh, it's more of a fad, I'm sure, but it's a Japanese tradition of Shoshugiban. This process is used to preserve the wood by charring it. So the heavily charged surface of the board makes the wood fire retardant, uh, as well as resistant to rot, insects, and decay. We find that if you take this pure material, a wood-based material, uh, this, in this case, looking at a picture where cedar was used, you can use pine. Uh, we're actually charring that surface. We're, we're adjusting its properties of the wood. It gets a, uh, you know, a low VLC clean uh, clear coat from a manufacturer that actually processes this. 
and we're able to pre-install this onto a wall assembly. And that's really nice because now we have a, a low impact material, it's healthy, it's durable, and I think it looks really cool, but that's just what, that's just my opinion. Um, so I think others are starting to like that kind of material more and more. Circling back to windows and doors, um, you know, the option there exists where we're using all wood-based windows and doors or wood with aluminum clad. So I won't speak to the manufacturer specific right now, but we're talking about a material that, um, again, this is something that is um, low impact, it's healthy, it's durable. I think it's a longer lasting material and it's possible now. Again, you're looking at a picture of a Passive House certified window. Uh, the reason for the balloons or the airbags is to pressure regulate uh, the, um, the argon gas fill as you change elevation. So that's why those are used and utilized because we live in the mountains. So it's just a required step that we have to take. Um, I keep going here. Uh, not to mention any manufacturers here, but we're, uh, as Brett alluded to in the introduction, fresh air is an important thing. And you've got some sponsors that do this. For us, it's a key staple. We require it on every project. And in fact, we embed it and in, integrate it into the design. And it's so important because the, the drivers for healthiness for us, and these are probably repeats, is indoor air quality. And poor quality leads to a number of health issues. For me personally, I have uh, severe allergies. So I have many triggers that can exist in a dusty, um, dirty um, type of home. And that those can translate into, you know, things during your day, sleepiness, headaches, and we want to avoid things like the pollen, the dust, the itchy eyes, and allergies on a day-to-day -day basis. And if there's one thing I can speak to when I have uh, folks give feedback on a house is that their investment into a fresh air system is the only thing they really start to talk about when they talk and give feedback on a project, which is really great to hear that. So and finally, uh, Bill, there was yeah, a, um, yeah. a specific question yeah. um, on ventilation. Um, yes. And so, you know, the, the specific question here is, you know, how are you handling, um, you know, uh, the makeup air for things like clothes dryers or right. kitchen exhaust hood? Is that taken care of with the, um, with the, with this system? And can you just, you know, for just basically elaborate what a system like this is in basic terms? You got it. Um, you know, a, a fresh air system for me, what's defined as is it's a, it's a, uh, a balanced and um, uniquely or specifically uh, ducted system, which means it's its own system is what I'm trying to say. And we have a balanced supply and exhaust um, throughout the entire uh, volume of indoor air. Uh, so we're supplying to bedrooms, we're supplying to living areas, common areas, and we're exhausting from areas where we've got moisture and sources for you know smells and contaminants like kitchens and bathrooms. And um, that system is also doing a heat recovery uh, uh, feature. But so the question is, when we talk about bath fans or we talk about a kitchen stove, we talk about dryer exhaust vents or wood stoves, it, it all needs to be calibrated within the lens of a, a passive house air tightness, so an airtight home, and that the, the appliances that are selected for that house are, we're aware of what those requirements are for, for living in an airtight home. So, we tend to have all electric style homes um, that don't have gas ranges, that have the ability to um, have the ventilation system kick on high when we're cooking something. So there's automated features there, there's some static features that you can select. Then we're selecting appliances that necessarily don't have vents for, for clothes dryers. And that if we do have an exhausting appliance, we vet and check the system has the ability to offset it's balanced airstream to exhaust higher in those points of demand. Uh, and that's an automated feature, which means it's automatically detecting the difference between inside and outside pressure on the system. And it's helping create a, a, a neutral balanced space. And then in the case of wood stoves or fireplaces, wood stoves is always a popular question. We're direct venting those and directly exhausting those. They don't affect the air requirements of an indoor airspace. That, that is a, just a broad overview, but um, the final statement is that every plan or design, um, we make sure that any and all appliances or anything that's getting selected for that house, that customer is fitting within an airtight space. And that, that airtight, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So just that, um, that, that ventilation system 
is we know exactly if uh, what are the characteristics of that system itself, how much can it automatically uh, correct for a negative pressure, and that mm -hmm. those those appliances are vetted uh, before design is completed. Yeah. So I know to, to eliminate holes and costs, um, some folks use the uh, heat recovery systems to also vent the bathrooms, and in some cases now we're seeing them also venting the kitchen hood range. Is that either of those mm -hmm. strategies one to use or not use? Well, I've seen that, um, I've seen that, and I've, I can tell you that the approach we take is that we basically rethink, um, rethink the hole, and we use the main ventilation system in this case, in this case, it's a vendor. What I'm referring to is um, one where uh, that whole system takes care of every every um, fresh air requirement, and so it all exhausting appliances requirements and fresh air requirements. And it demands that you actually rethink some appliances. It demands that we rethink a kitchen exhaust hood, a clothes dryer, and a, and a fireplace. Um, so I would say that to answer the question, um, it's handled in the design. And we get creative as far as problem solving which appliances to use, and that there's a lot of solutions now to date in 2019 um, where they come up with a really, really great you know spot um, fresh air solutions uh, per room whole house solutions, and then ones that can automatically detect negative pressures and handle those imbalances. Um, but a level of creativity to solve them for sure, Brett. That's a great point. That's a great question. And it kind of is handled right now, specific case by case, if there's someone that wants something unique or specific about that space that might not be um, handled, um, you know, in a typical scenario. But um, lastly, I'll say is that when it comes to the tape question, um, more on the health side of things is that we are focused on using and procuring um, materials from manufacturers that have um, uh, non-oil-based material, and that this this type of tape that we use is acrylic-based. Um, that and the membranes, and they've got great permeable perm ratings on this material, which means that they are vapor permeable, which means they can breathe. Uh, they can they can let the moisture out, but they keep the air tightness solid. The the tapes and materials that are, we're using are um, uh, rated, uh, you know, for long-term bonding um, of to you know wood-based materials, which means that they're just a really great a solid hold for many years to come, and that um, these tapes don't necessarily dry out like an oil-based tape could. Um, I know that the tapes that we use, once it's on a piece of wood or a piece of OSB or it's on a membrane, uh, when it's there and it's firmly pressed and it sets up, if you want to take that tape back off that material or substrate or that wood, it'll actually tear the tape or it'll tear the membrane or it'll tear the OSB apart just trying to get that tape off, um, which means that we know that there's a rated bond there. We know it's high quality, it's durable, it's vapor permeable, and this stuff is really focused on air tightness principles. So that's why we like using it. Um, so with that, you know, there's a few, I'm sure there's a few questions that we can definitely open it up and answer, um, but that really sums up for, for me on this last point, how we define a really healthy home and the integration that we use as far as material inputs and that I hope we had a chance to learn a little bit about how we're creatively um, thinking about spaces, thinking long-term, and that you learn a little bit about how we do off-site building, and um, we'd be more than happy to take some questions and open it up here at the end. So thank you, everyone, and I'll remain here just to answer some questions. Yeah, Bill, thanks. We got a lot of questions uh, pouring in, and before we get to those, before we wrap up, just want to say a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, all of you for joining us, and a big thanks to our top tier sponsors who allow us to do what we do, uh, Shrenergy for both on the go, in the woods, or in your small office or home, backup electric uh, solar power uh, generators for not when, but if, or not if, but when the grid fails, uh, T-Stuck, uh, structurally insulated framing systems, full-blown insulated studs that reduce costs. Um, and improve energy efficiency in the walls. And then, of course, Mitsubishi Electric, get your next project to net zero all electric heat pump systems uh, that work. So, yeah, we've got a lot of questions coming in. And obviously, I think a big one here that we should address, given that it's in the title, um, is, is, is foam, um, and especially spray foam or rigid foam. But the question is, um, you know, I don't know if you use any of that in your projects or if it's customized. 
But uh, I guess what is the reason uh, you know that you would uh, a avoid foam products? Yeah, no, it's good. It's a great question, and you know maybe we deal with it so much that um, we don't even talk about it anymore. So apologies, everyone, if if we went over that or glazed over it, is that we use no foam in our process for anything above grade, which means that everything above grade, everything above a foundation, is either wood based, acrylic based. Um, uh, it's talking about insulation products. So we're using blown in, blown in materials like cellulose. Uh, the exterior uh, insulation is a fiberboard, which is a wood-based product. They take um, basically material uh, sawdust or, or cutoffs from glue lamb production and press that into a board. And I think we're familiar with some of the brands that are out there, but you know, low energy input, really great recycled material that has a high perm rating and a great R value for its material. And we just need enough to cover the insulation to then, as you can see, get to a level of pass file certification in a cold climate. It's very doable. All the, all the furring strips, all the material, everything we're using above grade is wood. Um, when it comes to foundation systems, you bet there are uh, foam solutions that are below grade that are still being used, and it's depending on the project how we use them. But everything that we produce as a company or source for a project is, is all wood-based or uh, non-foam insulation-based. Great, thanks. Um, so here's some questions that I'm gonna merge together um, about uh, connecting your panels. And so um, the yeah. first one is how are the panels attached mechanically? Is electrical in the exterior wall panel pre-installed? And the second one is how do the panels attach to a slab on grade foundation? Are anchor bolts used? Great question, everyone. And thanks for asking them. I'll take the mechanical one first. When it, or I should say panel to panel, then, me, then mechanical. Um, panel to panel, everything's happening within an interior service chase or a service cavity. That's a frame that we provide on the design of the enclosure. It provides us with a space that we can then basically do business inside of our airtight structural insulated shell system. And it applies to both the roof and the wall panels. Um, that space tends to be two and a half inches in depth, and it's enough, it's enough depth for us to locate and typically only land electrical wires and um, uh, you know, mounting those fixtures or boxes or whatever in that space um, inside of the airtight detail. Um, when it comes to mechanical electrical plumbing, all of those items are installed on site. It's a classification for a prefabricated manufacturer, offsite manufacturer, uh, you'd have to take a next step up. We just don't have those licenses or the ability to do that just yet. Uh, our integration stop at providing that chase and, um, and obviously on the outside, we can do the siding. But for the interior, I wanted to say that everything is connected um, either with a, a structural screw or Simpson hardware on the inside. Everything's engineered, pre-engineered uh, connections and then they're verified per um, uh, a code office or a building code department site by site. And any and all those, any and all connections take place within that service chase. And specifically on a slab, we use a hold down detail but that's pre-installed to our wood framing. It's just engineered and that gets anchored into the concrete or into uh, the foundation wall inside that service chase. So that, that actual hold down is the depth of the chase itself. And then we're using anchor bolts post installed uh, once we're arriving on site. Uh, and keeping on that uh, question, there was one about um, connections between foundation walls and roof, roof uplift okay. with total path load tie downs per code. Yeah, and so anything that we have that we review per a building site, that any requirements that we have from an engineering perspective um, can get and is laid out in, in that service chase and on our standard engineering details. Um, if there's a requirement to do a hold down or a strap or anything that you have, um, we've got a bracket or a piece of hardware from a Simpson catalog that we can utilize and feature into that interior service chase. Uh, sometimes there's a requirement to hold back the insulation on the exterior side of framing to embed uh, hardware based on a requirement for engineering. This is not always the case, but sometimes used. In this case, we just have a scope of service that on site, at the site, we fill in those areas that needed exterior insulation once that hardware is installed and tape that off to make sure we've got an airtight, weather tight shell at the end of that week. 
Um, but really, the, the large question is answered is that we've got standardized engineered connections for pretty much every code department, and we revisit those and issue that content per project uh, that integrates any requirement, no matter what, um, on the system. Um, so kind of speak, uh, staying on with code, um, you know, what kind of uh, challenges do you run into with building code for doing anything as far as right-sizing homes, um, bringing in off-site construction? Um, what, uh, I know codes are different all over the place, but uh, do you see any uh, challenges that continue to crop up um, across yeah. the projects? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question because it's it's definitely the mainstay. Every project that we do, we make sure to vet that the requirements of the local code office, the code department. Um, and sometimes, and the biggest challenge that we've had is to have and make sure that even though we have, um, uh, take an example project, uh, 1,500 square foot home, there could be 30, 35 panels. We're up to maybe 200 pages of shop drawings that are get generated to then get approved um, or engineered, I should say. And depending on that code department, they may require framing inspections. And this is a big item that we've had to solve where we actually do inspections in our facility, at our production facility, uh, that verify that the, the engineering requirements and the shop drawing, what actually got built in reality, gets checked by a third party inspector that's signed off on and sealed on those shop drawings so that when you arrive at the building site, matches the engineering and the requirements for that specific site. To say we're shipping to Ohio, we're shipping to Michigan, to make sure that those checks take place, those inspections occur. It's documented on a shop drawing, which is sealed by an engineer or an inspection agency, and that that's all verified ahead of time before we, again, touch a stick of lumber or move to make an actual wall. And that's been the biggest question I think that we've had as a challenge is not so much that we can't embed a requirement into a wood frame wall or that we can't integrate a solution. It's that just knowing that specific questions that we can have that scope of service queued up and make sure that it's taking place uh, ahead of time before we actually go to build something. Uh, Bill, have you looked at sheathingless panel design, i.e. alternative shear bracing design to eliminate OSB plywood? I've seen some examples in Europe. Um, we haven't really played around with it too much, just based on um, wanting to really speak the language and leave that sheathing layer uh, to then, again, you know, really really um, support a requirement and a typical, you know, wood frame wall always has a sheathing on it. Um, I will say that um, there is definitely something to be said about value engineering these, these uh, the offsite building system. There's, there's ways to make it better, you bet. Right now we're on version four with our system, which means we've had four versions of it in our company's history. So we've been doing about four years. And that as we look to future versions, we're always looking to find ways to take extra material out of the wall and find more creative ways to just you know, limit the use of something. You bet. I think it's a great question. But as of right now, we have not explored that. Um, so one of the, the, the theories behind um, off-site construction, modular construction, is that now with um, you know, the labor shortage going up, and costs going up to do uh, construction, not being able to find anybody, that um, you know, there should be some you know, cost savings to be had by doing this. Um, do, you, do you know if that's uh, actually panning out in, in, in the real world, if you tried to compare what you were doing versus somebody just doing a, a stick build? Yeah, you know, um, I would say to, that's a great question, and we can keep it within our within our market of higher performance, low energy use buildings. Uh, so I can answer the question two ways. If we wanted to take our offsite deliverable, um, or I should say the offsite deliverable, you can find companies that can uh, build and deliver an open frame wall assembly that meets a code required minimum level of insulation. And that's really just rather just one input to framing into sheathing delivered to the site to speed things up at the site. If we look at a solution of the assemblies that we're producing specifically and that we're building it basically always to the passive house standard, if you really think about that, that's truly, I think, you know, just it's, it's rather remarkable and it's, it's very different. 
that we have to look to see who's also building a passive house, say, spec performance on site stick built. And when we compare those two examples together, um, we're definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, more attractive because of the speed and, and the ability to pre-plan those connections ahead of time in a climate controlled shop. There's definitely efficiencies and, and savings to be had. If we take our offsite solution, which is again, passive house spec, even if it doesn't get certified and compare it to a standard stick build um, site, we're definitely going to be um, a premium priced product. Uh, but again, you know, it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. Our price is also coming down with time as we increase volume, like I alluded to earlier in the ability to buy down the price of a triple pane window and door source domestically. But um, it's still not a mass market price point yet because our volume is still low volume, to, to be frank, um, to answer the question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, can you articulate re again real quick why, um, why you have a preference of uh, slab on grade? You bet. Um, I really like the slab on grade because to me it speaks to um, a simple build and a simple site. Um, yes, sites can change, you know, topography can be great, which means we can have a 13 foot difference over 50, 40, 50 feet, which means we have to deal with that. But I would say from a simplified build, uh, I always ask the question, if we want to put a house at a site, save the uh, extra money invested to create a conditioned space below grade, find creative ways to store material in an unconditioned space like an attached garage, and really, really make a nice conditioned space for the occupants, and that is the focus of the home, um, not that we need to condition our goods and our storage as well. I think the most important primary focus should be the actual occupant, and if we don't intend to use the space, uh, constantly, and it might basements are commonly used as like for storage. Let's keep those. Let's keep the occupant space above grade, with access to sun, with access to light. Not invest into something that needs to be invested into below grade, and find ways to do creative storage in like a garage space, detached or attached garages. Um, can the walls be modified later with additional windows? Um, example, is the wall uh, compromised structurally? Um, we can always find, you can always retrofit your home. It would be, it would be a, you know, a standard remodel or retrofit. Um, what I like to say, because this question does come up sometimes, is that um, because the house was built in a shop format and we have a shop drawing per panel and we can do a takeoff dimension to know exactly where, say, every stud is in the home, you've got a great roadmap and an excellent guide to know exactly where to modify a project and where, where you would be able to find the hardware to disconnect to cut stuff out. But um, to move and to change the exterior envelope, it would be a standard remodel or change to the home. Yeah. Um, are, so are you saying that you do not fill rough opening gaps, shim space between windows and rough framing with anything other than tape? Uh, it's a great question. Um, when I say tape, that's sort of a blanket term. There is many options with the manufacturers that focus on providing um, specifically um, acrylic-based healthy material that focus on a low energy use um, uh, vapor permeable material. So there's a few manufacturers that focus on these products and they have a wide range of offerings uh, and I classify that and sum it up in one word as tape, but uh, specifically on the question for the windows and doors, we use an expanding, a expandable uh, gasket, which means that we do the belt and suspenders method all over. No matter what we do to connect, we, have, we find ways to, uh, to seal up with two, um, uh, two pieces of tape, let's call it. But on a window and door, we do an expandable gasket around the frame uh, that's attached before the window and door gets set. And then we do another piece of tape that gets attached to the frame next to the gasket that then gets taped to the rough opening. And since we're using windows and doors that really speak to air tightness, it's very easy to make that transition from rough opening to the window and door. And that since we're an offsite manufacturer, we can install windows as tight as quarter inch tolerances, which means we can make these puppies, you know, Real, real close to the frames, which means there's not much area to to fill in, 
and we, we plan that on purpose that we don't have to use a lot of material to fill that gap. Um, is it possible to do like a one-story home with flat ceilings and a truss roof with loose fill insulation above in a vented attic? Um, and is it right to assume trusses are shippable and less than 12 feet high? Yes, of course. Um, there's many options that you can take uh, if we want to deviate from a panel. Um, we've done many wall-only projects that were just a well-only solution that attached to a foundation and then a customer uh, elected to install a truss on site and then have an open, you know, open blown insulation that's vented like normal, that's no problem. Um, we have the ability to produce those parts and many offsite manufacturers can actually make the, the truss or the part to be installed at the site. Uh, so there's an option there. Um, you're just increasing the scope of work at the site to install, but very doable, and yes, it's possible. Yeah. Um, and then going back to the windows again, how do you address the sills? Great. Yep. Thanks for bringing it up, um, Brad and whoever asked the question. Um, since we inset our window or door um, up to the insulation, exterior insulation, which means there's a two to three inch space um, where that window or door is pushed back behind the plane of the wall, behind the, behind the exterior plane of the wall. We do a standardized sill detail that comes from the window or door manufacturer where we are um, installing a metal sill pan. It's sloped. So is the opening. The opening is also similarly sloped at an angle um, at, at the sill of the window and door. And those, those metal sill pans are installed per the manufactured connections um, to allow for the water to exit the opening um, out, of our, out of our window and door opening. So that's a standardized detail that we use to get the water out and to create that, to create that um, uh, exit of water at every opening. So gasket inside only then? Correct, that's right, Brett. Um, we do the gasket on the interior portion of the frame. We do an interior airtight tape. We also do uh, an exterior watertight tape on the exterior side. So in that case, a window and a door, there's three types of ceiling that's happening uh, in general. Uh, it sounds like there's some elaboration on that question, but uh, feel free uh, to uh, elaborate, but I have a couple other questions here and then we'll get back yep. to that one. Um, so my, my, my question is, uh, um, uh, so going to, to Passive House, and I know there's, um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, how do I say this? There's a lot of strong emotions on Passive House and what <laughs> version of Passive House is used. And I understand that, um, though my take is, is neutral. I'm, Let's just get people getting certified and moving forward, and, and we can all win that way. So setting, just taking that and putting it in that context, you know, can you just quickly explain to us, um, you know, why it is that what appears to be you, you, you utilize the international or, or German version of Passive House over U.S.? What is it that, you know, you like about that standard um, for, for, for what you do? Oh, that's a great question, and I think it's really applicable today, and it's something that we need to be talking about because as the past health community grows, I think we need to, like you say, Brett, have a bridge between both and not carve out either or and support all to find a way of your brand of how you want to deliver a project or, and, or request one. And it just happens to be that there's different areas or pockets around the country, depending on where you're at, that focus or use a certain brand of the past health or have a, some, some sort of an ideal I can tell you specifically that uh, the reason for us to start but not end with the international version is that they had a very robust and a, a well, uh, well-written uh, requirement for a panel manufacturer, which means that if we're talking about how we communicate and require an assembly to have a, meet a performance target, um, we actually picked the harder one of the two in the sense that uh, the documentation required to receive and to prove that the building science is pure. Um, not to say that the American uh, Chicago-based CS uh, 
has any lack of performance. I just think that when we went through it as a company and we found their requirements and protocol to submit documentation was um, was significant, and it asked it helped us ask questions that uh, we maybe were not aware of and were were true to to answering and making sure that we had a very wholesome, complete package offering. But to me, I remain positive with both. Uh, there's no reason why we wouldn't work with both. Um, and we support both programs as far as the data required to perform and to build a package. So either way, passive house is a passive house and we can support that. Yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, thank you. And speaking of, of data, and again, going back to the energy modeling, um, do you all go back and look kind of at a year's worth of data on your projects and try to track um, their actual usage um, and kind of line it up with the energy modeling and what the anticipated usage said it would be? Yeah, we, we've done that uh, in the case of we built a house in uh, in Michigan and um, this is the only one that we've had information on and it's been, I can honestly have to admit, it's not been as detailed as it maybe it should be. Um, as far as to report, I don't know if I'd be prepared to report um, as far as feedback. I can say one thing that we can do a better job at and in general we can do a better job at is analyzing and forecasting American plug loads and American behavior versus a European assumption for appliances and appliance usage. Uh, lighting, uh, heating and cooling was spot on in that project, but we were generally off as far as what was used as far as electricity demand for appliances, TVs, computers, coffee makers, that was a bit, um, there was some error in that data, you bet. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And, you know, uh, last question here before we wrap up, um, you know, you, you said electricity and you mentioned, um, you know, all electric homes and it's, you know, pretty clear to us that the, what we noticed or called the hashtag or electrify everything movement is well underway. And it seems to be you are involved in that, you know, whether you want to be intentionally or not. Um, but can you just speak to the, you know, why, you know, why you recommend or, you know, do all electric projects? Is it typically, you know, client choice? Is it something that, you know, comes from you all that you want to do or what, uh, you know, what are your general thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, as we position ourselves and provide an offering, you know, we we are providing at the moment, um, you know, the use of a space, the program of a floor plan, the, the decision for the envelope or the enclosure and how that works. As far as the the appliances, I think that, um, and gas versus electric appliances and heating equipment, et cetera, et cetera, I think this comes with time as we basically um, uh, phase out the need for a fossil fuel. I think that um, it's not needed anymore as proven. And I think it's just something that remains as a habit. I mean, as far as not needing a, a typical fireplace or wood stove in a passive house, meaning that that's, it would actually overheat a space. Me personally, I would still love to have a wood stove because I think I like the smell of a wood, a wood fireplace. I like it's a, it's a nice ambiance. So I think until uh, we just have to add time to the equation to carve out and phase out some of these nostalgia items because I think that there is an answer uh, you know, for an all electric house or an all electric appliance, no matter what. So I think it's just, it's just habit and it just needs to get phased out. Um, that's kind of the best opinion that I have um, for now. Maybe I'll have an update that in about a year, Brett. <laughs> we'll talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Fair enough. Um, oh, and I guess the, uh, the, the last question uh, was just simply, you know, how far, how far of a, of a range, um, you know, can these uh, um, off-site uh, walls be be shipped? Yep, we can um, we can ship coast to coast in the cold climates. And uh, right now, a, a primary focus for us is in fact the Rocky Mountains because we're physically near those locations. But we're able to ship uh, to anyone's building site that's living in a cold climate and then meets the requirements of an order, which we can get into. In, and you can ask me in an email or a phone call. I'll be happy to explain and, and detail that out. Great. Yeah. So, and 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 to 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 wrap up here uh, on that note, um, Bill, I just really want to thank you again for for joining us again here years later, taking time. I know you're you're working uh, quite a bit 
getting this uh, product up and going and running and getting more homes done, and it's a great effort, and we're excited to see this. So uh, as we wrap up, where can, um, can you just reiterate where people can contact you to find out more information or learn more? You got it. Um, and thanks again, Brett. It's really great having a chance to, to be with you again and communicate, uh, you know, this great industry that we have that's evolving. You, you can all reach me at, at sales at phoenixhouse.com is a great way to connect via email um, or the numbers on there. Or if you go to www.phoenixhouse.com, if you put any feedback in any of the comment boxes or contact us, it goes directly to me. And I'd be more than happy to take and schedule calls to answer questions and discuss uh, any more specific related items from today's talks. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Phoenix yep. House. Thanks, all of you, for joining us and all the fantastic questions. This is one of one of the best um, dialogues we've had on some of our sessions in a while, so I really appreciate that. Uh, have a happy new year, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one. Uh, take care.